Hello, I'm Alan, and I'm so glad you're here. I want to share with you today the, the amazing privilege you have to lay your life down for God. I want to paint a picture of what that really looks like to me according to Scripture. The modern church is kind of built on a, an idea of, of serving God and attending church and doing good for God. But there's a walk with God, a place with God where it costs you everything. It's your whole life. It's your whole day. It's all your plans, all your future. Uh, a traditional church will allow you to go to church on Sunday and Wednesday and, and give 10% of your income and 20% of your time. And then go about your day being a good person. Be a better man. Be a better woman. Uh, don't yell at your spouse too much. Don't yell at your kids too much. Don't cheat on your taxes too much. Start to live holier and then go to church on Sunday and Wednesday. But there is a walk in the scripture available for every believer, which means that you have the opportunity, you, to walk intimately with Christ, with the Holy Spirit, for the rest of your life on this earth, and that you yield your life over to Him. Now, the idea of that attacks a certain idea that I, am, I go to church and I change, and see, when I began to learn about transformation, I started to see that it's more than just changing my lifestyle. It's about transforming who God wants me to be and, and how important that is as a believer to not just try to be a better person, but to be a different person, to be the person that God made you when you were born again and to grow up in Him. I'm going to start over in Galatians today, chapter 2, and we're going to see what the Apostle Paul used for his wording. Most people, when they go to church, they, they go with a mess of problems. They just got saved. They've been raised, living a certain way their whole life, and then they find Jesus. And then the preacher begins to tell them how they should live. And many people adapt to that kind of life, that that's how I want to be. I want to be nicer. I want to be holier. I want to be better. And I want to give God the glory and give God the, the time that I can. But there's such mu so much more involved with transformation, where it's not that he's asking you to give your life to him the way it is. He's asking you to let go of the life that you, you came to him with and to grow in the life that he gave you. See, before you were saved, you had not experienced life. You were in existence, but you were not alive. The Bible says that we are dead. We're already dead. We're born to a dead species. Not dead like a dead animal on the road, but dead as in there was no life in us. And that describes the human race, uh, a race of people that have no life in them. They're darkness, uh, they're, they're, they're dead. And so when you get born again, when you ask Jesus in your heart, that was the first moment you tasted life. That's the first moment you experienced real love. And real life was the moment you were born again. That day you were uh, created by God and born of God. And you tasted life for the first time. I used to make fun of people when they come and say, Hey, I uh, just want you, want you, you should celebrate me. It's my birthday today. And, and I'd say, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't, social media didn't tell me it was your birthday. And they say, Oh, well, it's not my, my natural birthday. It's my spiritual birthday. I'm celebrating the day I got born again. And I would pat them on the head and go, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> and kind of snicker like that's a little too spiritual. But now as I've gotten a little more older and mature, I realize how correct they are. That you really did not come into existence. Your life didn't begin until the moment you were born again. Every day, every hour, every minute, until you accepted Jesus, you were dead. You lived in a dead species, a species of death, a species of darkness. And God was able through salvation to resurrect you from death to life. That's the amazing miracle of salvation. You are now a new creature. All things have passed away. So let's just look at that imagery. Before you were saved, everything about your life, your personality, your, your characteristics... Uh, your looks, your upbringing, your family, your nation, 
was all of a species of darkness, all of a, a species of death. And then you got born again, and that's the first moment that you tasted life. You breathed in the love of God. You seen the light of God. You never experienced it before then. And that is when you became a new creature. Now, the problem is that your old creature, this outward body, was not uh, instantly put away. But you were born again inside of that outward man. So now you have an inner man that's alive and an outward man that's left in darkness and death. And so what many Christians do, and it's the pattern of the modern church, I actually don't blame, uh, blame the regular folk as much as I blame the preachers who have stopped striving to find God and have lived in this, this realm of a modern church where it's about trying to get more people interested in God rather than trying to get people to grow up in who they are in God. So I, I love to tell the story of the two men who came to church, and one was a doctor and, and looked good. He was healthy. He's in his 50s, had all of his hair, and, and, and sharp, had a nice car when he pulled up with his wife and 2.3 kids. And uh, they sat on the, you know, the third row of the church and looked, looked great, happy family, prosperous, no debt, healthy body, and he's in church. But he's not saved. At the same time, someone picked up a homeless guy and brought him to church. And they sat on the other side of the church, third row, opposite of this family. And this guy, they promised him a lunch if he would come hear me preach. Uh, this is a made-up story, just to be clear. And he came to church, and, and his clothes were wore out, and he smelled because he hadn't showered. His family had abandoned him. He, was, he had no money. Uh, he was living off the street, not healthy, out of shape. And there he was in church. Both men are in my service. Both men are the same age, in their 50s. One is wonderfully blessed. He's got a wonderful family. They, have, they get along nice. Uh, they look good, they dress good, they're healthy, uh, he has all of his hair, they came in a nice car, they own their home, and there across the way is another man, same age, no family, no money, uh, unhealthy, and, and, and here they are in service, but you have to realize both of these men are from a dark species, a species of death, dead species, already dead. Uh, and going to be dead for the rest of eternity unless they find a life. And so here they are in my service, and I preach such a wonderful pretend service here, that, that both men come to the altar to get born again. And as I lead them to the Lord, they both receive a new nature and become new creations, new creatures. Uh, first, The first time they tasted life and love and had a breath of of light was that moment up till that moment all those years before all the experiences before were not in the same uh, species of light they were of the species of darkness so that was their beginning and that's really the 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 amazing miracle and and why understanding salvation could be a little complex because god took you out of one species and he's birthed you inside of another species and then you still carry the, the outward man of the old species. And so it's very easy for a Christian to just say, hey, I'm born again, I go to church now, I went to the bar, now I go to church and I live nice, I live good, I do good things for God and I give Him all the glory. And that's really how I could describe the modern church. The modern church has made it possible for many people to not deny their flesh, not to mortify their outward man, the, the part of them that was left over from the old species, and allow them to live for God uh, and serve God through the attributes, the characteristics, the personality, the traits of their outward man, and give God the glory for it. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean they're living in who they could be. That's the power of the gospel. You have wonderful things ahead of you. God has incredible things for you uh, to touch the world with. He wants to bring it up and birth it in you and then bring it up and cultivate it to where you are walking in Christ. Not walking in your old man in the name of Christ, but
but actually walking in Christ in you. They're two different things. They may look the same, but they're two different things. So my two men who got saved, they're at the altar, and, and, and they ask Jesus in the heart. Both of them have just tasted life, experienced love, and seen light for the very first time in all of their years. Every experience, every personality, every characteristic up till that moment is of the, the family of Adam, of the dead species. But now they're birthed inside of that, that man. Uh, there's a new man created, like a baby that has to grow up and mature. The problem with the modern church today, when I say modern church, I'm just trying to classify the mentality of many churches. Uh, there's wonderful churches and incredible things, and I thank God for anyone who helps people uh, get saved and go to heaven. But how limiting is it that that's your only goal, to get saved and go to heaven? Your salvation was your beginning, not the end. That's just the beginning of your life with God. And, and the end is when you stand before God. That's the end of your, your, your pathway of salvation. Until then, you're running a race to, to get there. And so both men now are born again. That means that equally they both receive the same nature of Christ in them. The, the rich man, the doctor who's healthy and wealthy and wise and, and has a great family and smart and, and prosperous has no advantage. He didn't get like uh, double the amount of the spirit because he was a better person uh, and better discipline. No, both of them, even all the good works that doctor did, let's say he went on uh, trips to different nations to help uh, in poverty areas, to, to be a doctor over there. If he's not saved, it's still of the world of darkness. Now they're both born again. Many churches might say to that doctor, they wouldn't do, but just in concept, they could say, hey doctor, you know, you, you're healthy, you're wealthy, your family's in order, you have a nice vehicle, a nice health, a house, you have no debt, you're prosperous. You know, that's everything us Christians are believing for. Prosperity, health, family, all those things. Could you uh, take the microphone, doctor, and turn around and please instruct us as the church how we can have those things that you have. We can be prosperous, have our hair, uh, be in shape, uh, be blessed, have an abundance, uh, have a good family. Will you teach us how you did those things? Give us the principles. Because now that you're born again, it's allowed. And we would never do it to an unsaved doctor. But hey, you know, now that you're born again, now you can teach us. The problem with that is everything he has obtained to get that prosperity, to get that wealth, to get that wisdom, to get that health, to have a good family, didn't come from God. It didn't come from uh, the mind of God. It came from the mind of the world. And even though it seems nice, it's still from darkness. And we're now children of light. We're no longer children of darkness. We should be getting our information from light and not from darkness. I'll read out of Galatians chapter 2. Verse 19. Galatians 2 verse 19. For I, through the law, died to the law that I may live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is an, this is an incredible statement. It's very important. It's very deep. And, and it comes from a place of depth that uh, I want to understand one day where, where Paul is, where this is coming from in Paul's heart. It's no longer I who live. See, he's not saying, I no longer live for myself, I live for God. That is the motto, uh, the motto of the modern church. Welcome to church. Glad you're born again. Praise God. We celebrate you. Now, we want you to live for God. See, that is, that is okay, but that's the modern church, and that's a definition of religion. 
that you're serving God through your flesh, through your outward man, and giving God all the glory for it. But here he makes this statement, it's no longer I who live. So everything up till the moment of salvation, I no longer give credit to. I no longer rely on and hold on to, but I have restarted my life and been born again. And from that birth of light and love of God, I now can build a new life. And with that new life, I serve God with that life. But the old life, I let go. Uh, I'll give you another set of verses here over in Philippians. Let's look at the Apostle Paul here. Now remember, he was he was uh, he wasn't in his youth a troublemaker. He wasn't a partier that went out and drank and messed with the girls and got in trouble. And you know, my testimony, I, I Apostle Paul, I just want to testify that you know I, I used to be a drug addict and but now I got saved. Praise God. That was not his testimony. His testimony was one of strict commitment to God as a Jew and a Pharisee in the training. And he, he defines it over in Philippians chapter 3. And I want you to look at this story, what I'm trying to share, and see how much of the church world is under the motto of, I am living my life in the name of Jesus. I'm giving my life to God for the service of God versus... I gave up that life, everything up till the moment I was saved, and now I have a new life. And from that new life, I am growing up and giving that life to God. They're two different things. And I hope you can see what I'm trying to say here. Here in Philippians chapter 3, let's see here, we'll start in verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. So Paul's saying, I, I'm a Jew that got born again. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So he's saying, I have no confidence in the old man. In any wisdom, any attribute, any ability that came from my first birth in my time in this world up till the moment I was saved. That's powerful. I have no confidence in everything that comes from this outward man from the first birth. Though I might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks I may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. So if we're going to talk about who might have confidence in their ability, in their old life, in the life they received from their first birth, Paul says, I probably am up there with one of the top guys circumcised the eight day so he was his parents did exactly what the what the tradition said uh, of the stock of israel of the tribe of benjamin a hebrew of the hebrews concerning the law of pharisee so he was trained from his youth and brought up to be a pharisee uh, from his youth and that meant that by the age of 12 they had memorized the first five books of the bible and this is paul's upbringing i was trained and brought up as a pharisee uh, and, and of the right tribe of Benjamin, I was, I was brought up by the best of the best and trained by the, the most important spiritual leaders of the time. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. I did everything according to the book the best that I could. I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, I've counted loss for Christ. So all that I've gained, I've counted as loss. Now, it's easy to say that if you say, yeah, I came to Jesus, I was divorced four times, and, and I was sick, and I was broke, and I was a, a, a drug addict, and a homeless guy, and I found Jesus, and he brought life to me, and, 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 and I thank God for that. I counted all that as loss. Thank God. But what if you're the doctor? Hey, you know, praise God, I count all that as loss. This is Paul's testimony. Paul's testimony was all the good things, all the memorization of Scripture, all the, the practice of studying the Old Testament and, and, and all the duties that I did and all the righteousness that I lived by, I count as loss for Christ. 
In other words, it could not, everything up to the moment you were saved, is not supposed to be transferred over to your salvation. And then you say, in the name of Jesus. So I made abundance of money, and, and now I just give it all to God. I'm still living by the same principles of the world in the name of God. But really what we're supposed to do is lay all that aside and go deep into God to where He begins to bring forward His truth, His principles in us. This is the walk of the Spirit. Yet indeed I also count all things of loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish or dung, if you read in the King James, that I may gain Christ. So when he counts those, counts those things as rubbish, as dung, and, and, and as loss, he's not saying, yeah, my, I used to smoke behind the, behind the barn and, and drink a little whiskey once in a while and flirt with the girls. No, he was saying every religious thing, every good thing, everything that I had, I counted as loss. I count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. Now, there's a big difference of you deciding what to use in your life for God versus him deciding. Um, that's a different thing. Him telling you, I want you to take your talent and use it for me is different than you saying, I have this talent and I'm going to use it for God. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, of Jesus my Lord, for whom I am suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. See, we're to be conformed, our outer man, to his death, while we're being transformed into his life, our inner man. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained. I love this. Not that I've already obtained. So that gives you some hope. It gives me some hope. That no, I'm not perfect yet. I'm still, still struggling, still wearing this outer man, still growing and maturing. And praise God, God doesn't wait till you're perfect before He involves you with kingdom business. Not that I've already attained. I'm not already retained, uh, obtained to uh, completing this process, is what He's saying. Or I'm already perfected, but I press on. I press on, I don't change course. That is the path that I'm on. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself as apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So we're, we're reaching forward to what God has in our future, but it also means we let go of the things of our past. It's easy to say, I let go of the abuse and the hurt and, and all those things, but he's talking about all the good things too, that you, you as a believer, the moment we're saved, the path is not just to get busy serving God. The path is to begin to allow that inner man to grow up in the things of God. And from that place is where we serve God with. Um, someone who is wealthy said to me one time, a very good man, a very good Christian man, said, yeah, you know, I, I have this money and, and I think I'm, I'm, going to, I'm giving it to the church in our town to build a good church in our town, $3 million. That's the shock and awe that, he, that they hit you with when they have lots of money. Yeah, $3 million. And as a preacher, you got to be cool. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd, what do you think? Do you think that God's pleased with me giving the $3 million to build a church in our town? And I said, well, that's the wrong question. I said, because it implies that you're given the money for the gospel. When really the proper way to interpret scripture is all that you have. You're at, see, you're acting like that money's yours. But really, as a believer, all that you have the moment you're saved is God's. You're no, you no longer own anything. Really, you're just a steward of God's money. So the real question isn't, if God is pleased because you gave $3 million of your money to build a church. 
The really question, real question is, did God tell you to use his money for that church? Because if you're a steward of everything of God, then, then uh, he tells you what to do with it. You don't get to tell him. That's not a hard thing when you're broke. But when you have lots of money, that's a hard thing to tackle sometimes. That even the abundance I have isn't mine. It belongs to God. And he gets to tell me what to do with it. I don't get to do it as I want. I give $3 million here and I keep the rest over here for what I want. And, and, and you can see the pattern in the modern church. You should give so much of your money and then you should give so much of your time. But really, he wants everything. He wants all of us. Let's go over to Romans chapter 6 really quick. Romans chapter 6. Uh, I'll start in verse two, uh, verse, verse three. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized in the Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we are buried with Him through baptism in the death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. See, Jesus came to our place of death so that he can be resurrected into life. That allowed you to go from death to life. So you were not born alive. And, and, and I know some of the terminology can be um, confusing sometimes. You were not, you were not born alive. In other words, you were breathing, you were in existence, but you were not born into life. You were born into death, to darkness. A person who, who lives their life and ends up in hell, they never lived. They've always been in the species of darkness. Every child born is, on a destin, is destined to end up in hell if they don't get born again. Now, we believe in, 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 in a certain amount of God's grace. If a child, a, a baby dies to a famine or abortion, if a baby dies as an infant, that we believe God's able to, to justify legally letting them be born again in heaven. But if a man lives his whole life and never knows God, he ends up in hell. And in that process, he has never tasted life. It wasn't that God sent him to hell. He was destined for hell, and God's trying to rescue him from it ever since. So even though he's breathing and he's existing, because once you're born or once you're conceived, you exist for eternity. So he's in existence, but he's not alive. You're not alive until you are born again. You tasted the very life of God. And here it says that we should walk in newness of life. See, that newness of life is that you're born again. You have a new nature in you. And also the inner man was brought to life. Now God wants to build you into the likeness of Christ. He wants to build up the characteristics of uh, love and joy and peace and kindness that Jesus had in you. Even though you're still carrying the emotions of love, the emotions of joy and peace of the dark world, of the darkness of the outward man, you still carry those emotions. They're not the same as the emotions that can be built and come forward as fruit of the species of life and love that you are now. You are born again. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. So you are now a child of God born again, and you have His nature in you, and that inner man is alive and brought to life. You have an intellect and a set of emotions that are fully of the character of the, the the characteristics of Christ, of love and joy. But they must come forward. They must grow up. Otherwise, they stay like a baby. They don't grow up. You have to grow up the the character of Christ in you. That's the fruit of the spirit. Many Christians spend their whole life serving God with their outward man and never focusing on building up the inner man, allowing him to grow up and mature. And to me, that is what it means to live our life for God, 
that we, we do those things for God. We live our life for Him. I'm going over to Luke chapter 14 for a, a famous verse here that you're familiar with. Again, the modern church allows many Christians to take the life of darkness that they were born to from the species of darkness called the human race and take that love and bring it over to the church. Take that joy and bring it over to the church. Bring that compassion over to the church world and say, I'm loving in the name of Jesus. But the gospel that I'm trying to show you, the pathway I'm trying to show you is so much different. It has taken that love of the dark, dark world, of the dark person, of the darkness, taking that, that joy of the species of Adam and leaving it and cultivating the, the love, joy, peace that comes forward from the nature of Christ in you if you'll take the time to allow it to grow up in you. It's not instant. It takes time for it to grow and mature. And that's why it's more important to spend time with God than it is just to be busy for God. I think it's good for us all to serve and be involved but if you neglect the growing up and maturing of your inner man, you'll always stay the same. And you'll find a religion that allows you to serve God with the flesh rather than mortify God, mortify the flesh with God's help. Over in Luke here, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. So when he says his own life, he's not necessarily talking about, I just hate who I am. I hate my life. He's talking about everything that comes from the natural man that of your first birth. We're to hate that. We're to dismiss it and say, you're not good enough for who I am becoming as a child of God. Not just the, the, the ugly things, but also the nice things. The love that comes from the natural man is not the same as the love that comes from the inner man. It's not the same. One's light, one's dark. How much stronger is the love of Jesus from your inner man versus the love from the outer man? As different as darkness is from light. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. So this cross that we're to bear and carry is putting the outward man not just smoking and drinking and chewing but everything that is from the family of darkness we're to put that on the cross in other words the doctor who's standing there with a beautiful family and all his prosperity i'm not saying he needs to quit his job and throw all that away and start again no 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 please i'm saying that he needs to look at that as all that i gained from this world of darkness I'm to hate it's not to lead me it's not to um, it's not to tell me who I am anymore I now have the nature of Christ in me and the Holy Spirit helping me to become like Jesus and so you're to hate all of that that's the family listen you have to hate your father and mother and what it means by hate is love them less but it means to hate like I don't love you anymore I don't I don't look to you as my source anymore the doctor cannot say, let me tell the church how to walk in, uh, in prosperity because he has no idea. He has no more wisdom than the homeless guy who just got born again. He has no more wealth than the homeless guy that just got born again. He has no more love than the homeless guy that just got born again. They both are starting at the same place. The doctor who's healthy and wealthy and wise has no more wisdom than the homeless guy because all of his wisdom all of his ability to make wealth and have a good family came from the world of man from the world of darkness that is what we're to hate not saying it's stupid but saying that cannot tell me how to be a child of god only god can tell me how to be a child of god and whoever does not bear his cross and comes after me cannot be my disciple i'm going to Go over here to 2 Corinthians. And we'll close with these verses here. Uh, 
2 Corinthians chapter 2. As I look at the modern church, and again, I appreciate every church, every man or woman who preaches Jesus and salvation and helping people to, to stay saved and get to heaven. But as I look at the modern church and see how much of there's a lacking of spiritual growth, there's spiritual experiences, there's spiritual achievements, but of actual spiritual growth, growing from light, growing from the knowledge of God and not, not just taking the knowledge of the world and giving it to God, but growing from the actual knowledge of God. I see a, a group of people who want to do well, but don't know how. And they get busy just serving God. That was my beginning as a Christian, was get busy and serve God. Thank God for when I learned from Pastor Dave how to seek God and spend time with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'll start in uh, verse 14. Here's Paul again. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of knowledge in every place. So in other words, everywhere I go, there is a diffusing, a smell uh, of knowledge of God. You know, my wife bought a diffuser at one time where you put oils in it and it shoots out this smell uh, of, of oil that's supposed to be uh, clean the air and that... And you can smell it as soon as you walk in the house. You can smell the diffuser. It's a little small diffuser in the corner. You can smell it through the whole house. And Paul says here, Thank God who dis diffuses the, the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Everywhere I go, there's a smell. Now you think about it. We all know people who smell good and bad. And, and whether they smell good or bad as someone walks past you and then there's a a moment of, of nothing, and then there's a moment of this smell of, of strong perfume or, or body odor that just kind of, woof hits you. And they've already gone past you, but you can smell uh, the diffusing of the fragrance that they carry, whether good or bad. And we all know people like that. We all know of driving down the road, and all of a sudden you go by a, a, a farm, and you can smell it. Or you go by a dead animal on the road, and even though you can't see it, you know there's a dead animal in a ditch somewhere because you can smell the death. Well, this is the picture Paul is painting. That everywhere we go, God is diffusing the fragrance of his knowledge to everyone around us. And then he says something. Then this is so powerful. Let's look at verse 15. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. So he names two classes of people that, that smell Paul. One is those who are being saved, and the other are those who are perishing. So one, these are the two classes of people that smell the fragrance of Christ's knowledge through Paul. To the one, we are the aroma to death leading to death. And to the other, we are the aroma of life leading to life. So to those who are saved, we are a fragrance of death uh, leading to death. But to the unsaved, those who are perishing, we are the aroma of life leading to life. So this is how we should define our message in the church today. That if you're saved, every message should smell like death to you. The message of the gospel to you is lay down your old life, lay down your own ability, lay down your own talent, lay down all of those things and put them to the cross and put them to death. Because now you are a child of God. There is life being built in you. You are to kill, mortify all the things of the old man. Not just smoking and drinking, but all the attributes should no longer be the leading and directing of your life. So to the church, to the saved, the message of the gospel should be 
Now you're going to heaven. Now you're saved. Praise God. Time to die. Time to let go of your life and serve God. Build Christ in you. Let that life lead you and let the old life of darkness perish. And then to the unsaved, to those who are perishing, it is an aroma of life leading to life. Verse 15. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma to death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God but as sincere of sincerity but as from God we speak in the sight of of God in Christ. So Paul is painting a picture of comparison of preachers. He's comparing himself to these other preachers, these false apostles who came into the church. And he's saying, they're preaching to your flesh. They're appealing to your outward man. And they're preaching life to your outward man. And Paul's saying, my message, the, 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 the fragrance that I carry to the church, to the believers, is one of death. Uh, death leading to more death. Welcome to our church. Can you smell death? Can you imagine walking into a church and smelling uh, death? And, and, and if you're a life seeker, see if you are seeking a gospel who, who uh, allows your outward man to live and thrive and serve God with the, with the outward man, you'll find a preacher who will feed that. But if you're seeking a gospel which allows God to build Christ in you and mortify the outward man, you'll seek that. And I remember Pastor Dave would be preaching in the church and, 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 and a new couple would come uh, and sit in the service and Dave, Pastor Dave would say, Now, we're here to pray and seek God and grow in God. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and, and so uh, you, you need to stop making excuses. You have time to pray. You have time to, to worship. You have time to read your word. Well, I can't, Pastor Dave, because I've got to pay my bills. I've got to support my family. And Dave would say, yes, I understand that. But do you really need uh, that big of a house? Do you need that new of a car? Who needs five TVs in your house? I tell you what, why don't you sell that big house and get a little house? Why don't you sell that fancy car and get an old used car? Still get you there. And then you don't have to work so many hours. You have more time to spend praying and worshiping and, and, and spend time in the Word. And without fail, with the, the husband and wife, one of them would be hungrier for God than the other one. And both of them have been Christians a long time, but one of them would go, praise God, I can smell it. I want, that. I want to live my life for God. And he was excited or she was excited to hear the message of death lay down that life of the old man and, and, and spend time allowing Christ to grow in you. Where the other one, other the husband or wife would say, uh, I, don't, I, I, don't like this, I don't like this church. Uh, there's something wrong with it. Because they weren't ready to go that far into God at the time. Many people will take their, their flesh and serve God their whole life, but very few are willing to go to a place of mortification where they don't live for their by their flesh anymore. If I could summarize the modern church, it is the ability to serve God through your outward man and do good things in the name of God. And, and see how much of the church world focuses on preaching to the church people, preaching life. You should have the best life now. You should be prosperous. You should be blessed, how to have an abundance, how to have a great marriage. All these things are taught about Christians when really the church should focus on if you're saved, you should smell death. If you're not saved, you should smell life. You should, when you meet with me and you're not saved, you should say, I need what you have. I want what you have. Please, how can I get Jesus? That is the fragrance of life to the unsaved. So much of the church is focused on babysitting the, the people who are saved instead of challenging them to grow up. The message to the Christian, the moment you're saved is, it's time to die. It's time to let go of the old life. I remember one person said to me, 
You're just like a death preacher. Die, die, die. I have a question for you. When do I get to stop dying? And when can I live? And see, what they were saying is, when can I just run and serve God and be happy? Why do I always have to push away, mortify, fast, and put away the flesh? And see, they didn't see that the, the very flesh they had was who they're supposed to mortify. They just wanted to be good and serve God with what they had rather than grow and mature the Christ in them. And I said, oh, well, you think I'm talking about dying to, the, to good things, but I'm talking about dying to, the, to the, the copycat, the counterfeit, the counterfeit love, the counterfeit uh, joy, the counterfeit peace that is from your flesh. That's what I'm talking about dying to. So that if you die to that, then the real love, joy, peace can emerge uh, from the nature of Christ in you. And so many Christians are willing to put up with counterfeit because it doesn't cost them anything. There's no price to it. Just I'm going to serve God now with what I have. And, and, and God's pleased with anyone who, who's going to heaven. But there is a walk of the Spirit to where He begins to 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 ask you to lay down your life and to quit chasing your dreams of your natural man, to quit serving life through your natural man, and to build Christ in you to live from that place. And, and the problem is with you is once you start living like that, you do not know it. You're not aware of it the same way uh, my teenage son may uh, go to gym class when he was you know 14. He's older now, so he showers all the time. He's He's aware, but before he was aware of body odor as a young kid, uh, as most teenager boys do if you go to their rooms, they don't smell it because they live in it. Well, you may not be aware of it, that you smell like death to your Christian friends. They look at you and the way you talk and the way you think and the way you serve God, and they think, you smell like death, like a dead animal. I don't want what you have. I want to have life and abundance. So many Christians are going to think you're odd because they don't realize that you're living a life of mortifying the outward man while you're building up the inward man. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged that even though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day and growing up in the things of God. And there are wonderful, wonderful things ahead of you that can only come from Christ in you. Let's keep praying. Let's keep worshiping. Let's stay on course. Because God is birthing not just a revival of miracles, but a lifestyle of how to help others grow and walk into the life of Christ in them instead of just serving God with their outward man. I love you and I appreciate you taking time with me. I'll see you soon. God bless.